Welcome to this edition of Connected with Kelly. I get to introduce you to Laura Huffless. This woman is incredible. She's the co-founder of Flight View, a full-service entertainment company here in Nashville. But she's so much more than that. Listen, she has been here and has worked her way up until she started her own company. She is now impacting so many people with her charity work and the charitable arm of Flight View. We're going to get into all of that. And she's going to give us a little tip on how to deal with some of those uh, negative thoughts that come into your mind. This was brilliant. I can't wait to share it with you. Guys, let's get connected with Laura Hutfliss. Okay, Laura, how are you? I'm good. I'm excited to talk to you today. It's been a while. It's been a while. So I want everybody to know the backstory. What was your very first job in Music City? Oh, I worked at this little retail boutique, uh, Optimum Brand, called Flavor. I don't know. If you oh my gosh, that. I remember yes. Flavor. Uh huh. Yes. Amy Collins um, was the owner, and all the celebrities would come in, and all the agents, and all the industry folks would come in, and I really have no style, but I was a really good salesperson. <laughs> so yeah, that was my first first job. And I was able to connect with people in the industry just by working there every day. And they got to know my name and I got to know who they were. So it was right out of college. And, you know, it's in the industry, it's really hard to get a job. So you just try to network as, as best you can. And it was the perfect place to network. You know, that's the interesting thing. I think a lot of people come here and they think I'm going to jump right into the music industry. I'm going for it. I either want to be a songwriter or, you know, I want to be an artist. They, first of all, don't know how. And then when they get here, they realize Nashville is a tougher nut to crack than they anticipate. I mean, there's a language, there's, there's a way that things happen in this city that you can't really describe to anybody else. Yeah. A lot of coffees. A yeah. lot of coffees. A lot of coffees. That's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. yeah. And that's what happened. I just started asking people who came into the shop to go to coffee. And when I met them, I would ask them to introduce me to two more people to have coffee with. And so sooner or later, I got to know everyone in the industry. And when a job opened up at William Morris, which is a talent agency, uh, I got the job. See, and that's the thing. It is about that networking. It's about those connections. But I think too, and I, I do want to hear your take on this, it's more than just a, hi, I'm Kelly, you're Laura, what do you do? How are you? It's more intimate here. It is more of a, you know, how is your mom? Oh, I heard your dog was sick. Are you, you know, what do you need? It, it feels more like a family than it does just a, a relationship on a business level. I always like to say that there's more humanity in Nashville it. Um, because there's networking in LA and New York and, and big cities like that, but it's lacking the humanity piece where it's strictly about business and what you can do for somebody else to get ahead in the career. Uh, and, and here it very much feels like people care about you and the person just as much as they care about the job or the position. And I'm sure that when you were at William Morris that you learned that even more because I know so many people that work there and it, and it is such a fantastic place to learn those skills. Tell us how that went down and what that individually led to. So I started off as an assistant working for an agent, one of the few female agents in the business at that time. Her name was Kathy Armistead. And I was so lucky to get to work for a female because there were so few. Uh, and so she really uh, guided me and gave me opportunities. Um, and so I eventually left the agency uh, to go work for um, a division of Ticketmaster. And um, they hired me to, to run their department. And then I eventually made my way to CIA, which is another talent agency, um, as an agent myself, and then grew the department there. Uh, but always having was really lucky to have female champions around um, at every stop really in my journey that were always encouraging me to step out uh, and step up into growth and never, and always challenged me to be uncomfortable, uh, never let me just rest and sit back. And, and so I'm so thankful I, I had that because there were, there were so few back then <laughs> uh, that I feel God just guided my path uh, to the right people at the right and time. What were some of the things that you faced when you were in those situations that you feel like, okay, it was uncomfortable, but now looking back, we've all got the pleasure of, you know, hindsight, looking back at it, you went, I had to do that. I had to go through that. 
A couple things come to mind. One uh, is just the way that I had to act or dress uh, was very intentional. Okay. Um, I, as a female in the industry, I couldn't appear, I actually dyed my hair, it was red. <laughs> it was like reddish black back then. I couldn't appear as an artist, right? That I was trying to make it as an artist, but I really wanted to make it as a businesswoman. So put my hair in a bun, I got glasses. I very much uh, dressed as the role uh, to be taken seriously. I wasn't out past midnight. I never got drunk or, or was out you know, on tour buses late at night. Like I just didn't put myself in positions to be perceived anything other than someone who was there to do business, um, which was different for a woman than a man back then. But those, those were the rules um, or the unspoken rules. Uh, I remember when I was an agent, um, I was at, at the time I was the only female agent uh, in the company and where all the agents sat around this big marble table. And since I was the new one, all the chairs were taken. So I sat in the back with the assistants. Uh, and of course it was all men. And so I just thought I'll sit in my chair in the back. It's fine. I don't, I don't have an ego about where I need to sit. And so several weeks that went by and uh, a man who worked at the company, he wasn't an agent, but came up to the, came up to me and he's an African-American man. And he said, Laura, you need to sit up at that table. And if you don't do it for you, do it for all the rest of us. And I just remember that shocking me uh, into moving up to the table the next meeting. And I, I felt awkward because I was, you know, the, the one that didn't fit in there, but I knew I had to do it for everybody else that was coming up the ranks. And um, I had to take that chair. And so there are specific moments in my career when I can think back when, when people challenged me um, or I made a decision to move into the uncomfortable um, and, and if not for me, then for everyone else. Wow. You actually had to pull up a chair to the table. That is so literal. And I actually had to take someone else's chair because there weren't enough chairs. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's kind of like the bar, you know, if, you if you're a regular at the bar, everyone has their regular chair. So I actually had to sit in a regular's chair, uh, but you know, no one's name was on it. So it was now mine. <laughs> I, you know what? Okay. Now thinking about that, sitting down in somebody else's chair doesn't seem like a big yeah. deal. At that moment in time, your knees were probably knocking under the table. Yeah. yeah. I, cause I was so, I, I didn't remember whose chair it was, but I just knew I was in somebody's. And so someone was going to walk in and be shocked. Uh, but yeah. And you know what? No one said anything. Somebody else, you know, pulled up a chair and they made room. And I find, you know, we worry so much about what people will think or how they're gonna respond or what they're gonna think about me or am I out of place? And especially as women, like, do I have a place there? I'll just, I'll just hang back until someone invites me. No one was gonna invite me. Someone had to push me up there. <laughs> and so a lot of times, you know, we just that's, I don't know why as women we do that, but uh, we all do, I've seen it. And, uh, and I think that that particular moment taught me that lesson. That's incredible. When you were there, obviously, you figured out what your role was. And I know that that takes a while and anybody's job for anyone. But in particular, did you realize all of the knowledge that you'd already gained from all of these other places and all of these other people and these relationships? Did it start to crystallize in your head like, oh, my gosh, OK, this all has come together to lead me to what I'm about to do? Uh no, I can actually say, I, I don't know that I ever put it together. Uh, it's hard to put it together when you're moving forward. It's, it's easy to see it when you turn around and look in the rear view. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think I ever knew that in the moment uh, or thought about it as I was looking forward. Um, but what a great gift to be able to turn around and see how God has just put all the pieces in place and equipped you so well for what's coming. And I can say that in my professional life and my personal life. Uh, and, and I think being able to see it in the past though, gives me trust and faith that it will work out in the future if I can't see it. It is easier to take the step once you've already taken the other step. Like the first step is the hardest. And then after that, you're like, okay, it's, it, I've done this before. Yes. And, and that, applies. I mean, I started my own company five years ago. And if I would have known now, or if I would have known then what I know now about what it, the company would become, I would have been paralyzed with fear. <laughs> uh, but it is really just taking the first steps and the easy steps. And, um, you know, the first step for Jeremy and I, my partner, when we started the company was, what do we want the culture to be? Let's just write that down. And then who do we want to join us? 
Let's go ask them if they'll join us. Let's buy a Mac computer. I remember going to the Apple store and buying our computers. And we just took it one step at a time. And now five years later, we have a multi-million dollar company and we figured it out along the way. But it's too overwhelming to think about that in the moment. And so I just think if anyone's out there wanting to start a new venture, don't think about it, what you want it to be from ten, like 10 or five years from now and get overwhelmed with that. Like, just think about what you can do today and just do that. So for everybody that's in Nashville, they've heard the name Flight View and they've seen some of the things that you've done and the projects that you've worked on, the campaigns that you've put together. Mm -hmm. But for those that aren't familiar, tell them about Flight View and what you guys do. So we're an entertainment marketing agency. So we work with big corporate brands, uh, Enterprise, Red Cross, Bumble, Victoria's Secret, uh, Cracker Barrel, Jack Daniels, Mount Hennessy, a lot of big brands, and we help them integrate into pop culture. And that looks a lot of different ways. So it can be um, a concert series, it can be a Super Bowl, uh, it can be partnerships with talent or celebrities or influencers. Um, we've done content campaigns, big experiential pop-ups and events. So it's always something new, it's always exciting, and it's always different for every client, which makes it really fun. When you and Jeremy were envisioning this, what was what was the idea? Obviously, you had culture first and, and you really knew that you wanted to build this. But what was the idea? Was it that you would have the brands and then marry them with the celebrities? Because I feel like it's always been the reverse. I feel like it's always been, you know, celebrities going after the brands. And I really do feel like you guys were big disruptors in that category. I had always been on the talent side. Yeah. So, you know, I always had brands coming to me wanting to work with my artists. And I would see the campaigns that would come in and they were boring. They weren't innovative. They didn't understand an artist's career. They didn't understand licensing or publishing. And, and so I realized that while the talent had an agent, the brand didn't have an agent mm -hmm. and people who work for corporations, you know, their, their job is to sell cars all day or chef Boyardee or whatever the product is they're selling it's not their job to understand the music industry and entertainment, right? That takes years and relationships like we just talked about to really navigate. And so I wanted to be their agent, right? I wanted to build an agency that could help them understand how to navigate this crazy industry um, and really create programs that helped artists too, instead of just a paycheck. Yeah. Like, what else are we doing to really partner and help each other win? So that's, that's how we started. We saw the need in the industry. Um, I also personally wanted to grow. I think where I was, there was a ceiling just by nature of it being a, a big corporation. Um, so I wanted to grow myself. And then lastly, we wanted to create campaigns that had purpose. I think we both loved our jobs, but, but we had lost the why. And so with Flight View, uh, a big portion of everything we make goes back to the community and back to charities. And we just launched the Flight View Fund this past year, which is a donor advised fund um, where we've given away this year close to a million dollars. Um, so we're very excited about, about that component as well. If you ever thought 10 years ago that you would have a company that you, yeah. it was your company that you started that could give away a million dollars to impact other people, would you have believed it? Oh, no. Uh, no. I wouldn't have thought I would have had my own company. That was not a thought and not even something I would have known where to start. I wasn't a finance major, MBA major. I was an art major. Okay. I can draw pretty pictures. Like that's it. Right. I'm, and so I didn't even know how to read a P and L. Um, so again, if anyone's out there wanting to start a business, it's okay. Just ask a lot of questions and find people that do know. And that's the great thing about Nashville. Like you said, someone is always willing to go to coffee, a lot of coffees and ask the dumb questions and they're happy to share. So I just, you know, went to a lot of coffees and asked questions and figured out the numbers and how to keep books and then hired people that were smarter than me to do that. And you know, one step at a time. So no, I would have never envisioned that, nor would I have believed in myself enough. Luckily, I had friends uh, and colleagues who believed in me more than I did myself. You know, I think that that's key because I think all of us have that self-doubt and all of us mm -hmm. have that imposter syndrome at some point. It doesn't matter how long you've been in an industry. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. how long you've been doing it. Yeah. It always creeps up in the back of your mind. And to have that support system and to have those people around you that can speak into you and tell you, no, 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 this is what you're supposed to be doing. That's, that's invaluable. 
I'm going to tell you my little trick that I have because it's right okay, here. Yes, please. So, so I think everybody struggles with the voices, right? The doubters, the, the voices that tell you, you can't do it. You're not good enough. Someone's better. The comparison, all of that doesn't matter. Like you said, you could be a CEO or bottom of the food chain. Everybody, everybody struggles. So I have something called my thought box. So whenever a thought comes in my head and I don't want to take it, I don't want to pick it up and I don't want to claim it. I put it in my thought box. Yes. My thought box is Chanel, but it's right here. Um, and if I open it up, you'll see all of these notes in there. Those are all my thoughts that I don't want to pick up. So I just leave them here and then I can focus on what I do want to focus on and focus on better thoughts. So I don't get sidetracked because what happens is that one thought leads to another, leads to another, and then suddenly you're in a dark pit, right? And you're paralyzed. Right. And so I just want to stop it right there. I don't want to pick it up when I put it there. So if anybody else wants to have a thought box, my staff laughs at me because I bring this to meetings. I carry it with me and it really works. I could just see you in a meeting and someone throws out an idea and you write something down and then they're paranoid. Like, oh no, she just put me in the thought box. That actually happened yesterday. <laughs> she thought her idea went in the thought box, but it wasn't. It was something in my head that was distracting me from hearing her idea. And that's what I told her. So many times we we're so distracted and we're not present. Right. And so this allows me to be present. I love this. Um, tell me about Triumph Over Tragedy, because this is something that you started. And I know this has become some, this is part of your mission now. And and your story is, is so incredible. And the fact that you're willing to share it and then to take it a step further and work with OnSite. Um, give us the details on what you've started and what we can look forward to seeing many years to come. Well, I went to OnSite a few years ago myself. Um, they have a wonderful program um, that many people in the industry go, go to. And it's really, I compare it to human school <laughs> where you go and you learn about yourself and your background and what makes you you and work through maybe things in your childhood or, or things that, you know, we can all grow, right? You, you work to grow and, and understand yourself. And so I did that. So I was familiar with OnSite and just a big supporter of it. Um, and then uh, I began a relationship with a man by the name of Austin Eubanks, and he was a survivor of Columbine. And his story is that after Columbine, uh, the doctors had prescribed Oxycontin uh, to, for, his, for the pain, for his wounds, he was injured. Um, and unfortunately, uh, that led to a 10-year addiction. Um, the good news is he found recovery, and so that's when we met. And uh, he had been clean for a number of years. Um, but then the 20th anniversary of Columbine came around in May of 19, 2019 or April, May of 2019. And, uh, he relapsed, um, and he overdosed. And so, um, I had to say goodbye and, and that, that was it. He lost his life to addiction, but even worse, the trauma that, that led to that. And so I realized there that there was a need, um, for survivors of mass shootings, uh, to get tools and resources to deal with the trauma that they faced uh, so that it doesn't lead to unhealthy medicators like addiction or other things that, that um, just take away life. And so uh, I started this program with OnSite and it's called Triumph Over Tragedy. And so we hosted the first program in March uh, with 60 survivors um, from multiple mass shooting events across the country over the years. Uh, and it was so successful that now we're hosting two programs this year. Um, and so what I also love about it is, you know, there's so many in the music industry who have been affected with the Vegas shooting several years ago. And, and I had an employee in my office who was, who was part of that. And so she was one of the first attendees to go through the program, uh, which was full circle full, uh, moment for me. So I just, I love that um, there's a program and resources and that, through my journey in grief and through uh, Austin's journey too, that it has inspired this gift for so many to then uh, find healing and hope. You know, what you're doing, and I know you know this, it, it's impacting so many more people and it's reaching so many lives. And it's incredible to know that through the pain that there is purpose and to find it, yeah. that's incredibly strong. So kudos and thank you for what you're doing because that's amazing. Yeah. They say there's five stages of grief. I think there's six okay. uh, and the six being purpose yeah. that I think we all have to find a purpose in the pain. I don't think there's a purpose in the death or the event or the tragedy. Um, you know, nothing, there's not a purpose in, in that loss, but, but we can find purpose in the journey through that. 
and it looks different for everybody that that was the purpose that I found and, and really brought me healing. And I think when we, when we get to that place, there's true healing, which allows you to move forward. And so I'm just thankful that, that, that was there. And, and I was able to, to lead that, uh, that endeavor. That's incredible. How would you define, or what would you say your connections are like now versus when you first came to town? Because I look back and I think, gosh, if I, I want to shake myself and say, wake up, you, you're meeting these amazing people and, and you're not taking advantage and you're not present. You're not thinking about what's happening right in front of you. You're not having these deep and meaningful conversations with people. And I wish I would have. So I know you probably feel the same, but, but looking at it now and, and all that you've been through, how, how are relationships different for you? Um, I will say looking back when I first moved to town, I mean, I was young, I was incapable of having the deep connections I can now because I've walked more of life. Like I am just a deeper, more connected individual with myself. Right. So now I'm able to connect with others on a deeper level. So I think part of that is just, you know, living life. Um, I think because I went through such a significant loss, uh, it's interesting. People started connecting with me differently. And I think before they perhaps had seen me as this very successful, you know, woman who has it all together and has this perfect little bubble. I even saw myself that way yeah. until that happened. And I cracked and everybody saw it publicly and saw me walk that journey. And suddenly they could share their brokenness with me more openly. And it, and I learned how to sit with people in grief and have empathy and slow down and all of those wonderful gifts, more gifts that, that came from that experience. And so my connection is much deeper with people, but I think it's because of my life experience now uh, that allows me to do that. Um, I do something called um, uh, the hard hikes. So uh, I live near a, a park and instead of, you know, with COVID, you don't meet people right. and you know, in bars or dinners anymore, which I actually think is great. And instead I walk, do hikes. Yeah. It's so interesting when, you know, you're, you're dressed in your workout clothes and you're, you're walking and you're hiking with, you know, CEOs and other business leaders. And it suddenly just takes down that front. And I, I've been hearing about people's hard. And so I call them the hard hikes. I just, it takes down that wall. And so I, you know, I've heard about women who have lost babies and um, men who have, you know, wives are in rehab and just so many things that, people, people who have, you know, their marriages are falling apart and, you know, it goes down the list. And I, my life has just been open to so much more of that, that it's such, it's so beautiful that you can have those connections and those conversations that you couldn't have before. And, you know, that goes back to what you said earlier. I feel like there's so much more humanity in business mm -hmm. in Nashville that you are, you can have those connections in that manner and that you feel comfortable. It, it, change, it changes the scope of the way that you interact with people, not only on a day-to-day -day basis as friends, but just as other colleagues. You know, you care about them deeply. You know what's happening in their world. If, you, if we can take a gift from COVID, <laughs> I believe the gift is that we all experienced hard together. So there's no acting like it didn't happen to you. It happened to all of us. Yeah. And I think that is the gift of this experience is it has allowed us all to talk about the heart of COVID because we're all in it together where an individual heart experience, sometimes you don't want to open up about that, but it's allowed us to open up about 2020 being a hard year and feeling community and connectedness in that. And um, something we've learned from onsite is that you can only process pain and community because you need to offload pain and you can only do that with other people. And so I, I find that people who have stayed connected and have really made that um, intentional uh, have really processed this year in a much healthier way. Laura, thank you so much for taking the time. I could talk to you all day. You're amazing. Guys, Laura Hutflish, she's incredible. Um, also, if you want to know more about OnSite, the places that we've been talking about through here, I'm going to put the information in the show notes at the bottom so you can check that out. I want to know, what are some questions that you have about getting connected in Nashville? If you're on the way here, if you're already here, if you dream of coming here, how would you want to connect to the music industry? Write that below and maybe I can get you some answers. In the meantime, make sure that you're subscribing and you hit that bell. That way you'll know when all the new episodes come out. I've got new ones for you next week, so get ready. All right, everybody, stay connected to the people and things you love the most. Bye.